Hey folks, how's it going? So, I know we're near the end of Echelon, so I want to keep the energy levels high, the coffee's going down. So thanks so much for joining this session. I'm really pleased to be joined by Paul, an expert in his field. He's got a really interesting backstory as well, so we'll learn a little bit about that, because we're going to talk about tough markets, but you've lived in some tough markets as well. So um, before we get started, Slido, I know they keep pushing the Slido thing, so um, I'm sure they're going to pop it up here again. So feel free to use that and ask any kind of questions that you have, um, and we'll do our best to answer some of the questions. So, hey, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce Paul in a minute, but style-wise, I want to make this more about the story of the human being behind the tech, because I think, it, like, Paul's got a really fascinating story as well, like how he arrived at this place and some of the, the, the crazy places you've lived in the world. You've spent some time in Afghanistan, we're gonna go there. And um, just sort of understand a bit about the why behind what you're doing with Harangi as well. So let's get started. So Paul, welcome, let's do an intro first. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, so I'm Paul, I'm the CEO and founder of Harangi, uh, as mentioned. <laughs> Um, but yeah, essentially uh, started my career working for the U.S. government after college, uh, working on cybersecurity issues there. Uh, shortly after that, I joined a small company at the time, which is about the same size as Harangi is now. It's called Palantir, uh, so a pretty big uh, company these days. But in 2009, when I joined, it was about 80 people. Um, spent seven years with them traveling the world. So first I was in Washington, D.C., uh, where I was from. Uh, then I spent a, <clears throat> a year in uh, Afghanistan, actually, uh, as Graham mentioned. Uh, after that, I went to Korea, uh, which is also where I got uh, the name Harangi. Um, then came to Singapore. Uh, I spent three years in Singapore working for Palantir. And then I was actually in New Zealand, uh, again, working on uh, cybersecurity problems in the government there uh, for Palantir. And subsequently came back to Singapore, uh, worked for Grab, where I ran their security team prior to starting Harangi. There's a lot to unpack there. Like, we can't just put that all in one sentence. I fear if I'm going to ask a lot of questions, I might probe into some interesting areas. So you were working for the government, you are in Afghanistan on cybersecurity. What can you share with us that you were working on here, that sort of public domain? Sure. Uh, yeah, so when I was in the government, uh, in like right after college, I wasn't actually in Afghanistan, I was in uh, Washington, but uh, essentially there I was working on um, helping solve cybersecurity challenges there uh, with intelligence. So. I can't get too much into what I was doing, but uh, essentially um, you know, looking at information coming in, uh, trying to decipher what was happening, and then <laughs> spitting out reports. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. You work out the, the missing parts to that. Sure. You were in Afghanistan for one year. Yes. What, what was it actually like when you were there? How was life like? Because you were in a very comfortable world in Washington. When did that conversation happen? Hey, Paul, we've got a job for you in Afghanistan. Tell us a little bit about the background to that. Yeah, I think like, I mean, throughout my life and like why I was interested in cybersecurity, working for the government, working for volunteers, it was, it was really just about helping people. Uh, cybersecurity was just kind of the thing I was good at um, and where it could add value. Um, I went to Afghanistan mainly because, uh, you know, I, I think uh, for any Americans out there, they went through September 11th, which happened when I was quite young. Always wanted to do something to contribute to that. Uh, had the opportunity to go to Afghanistan and help um, our troops or the American troops uh, as well as uh, Singaporean troops because I did work with Singaporeans there as well. Uh, and Korean troops, um, which is how I actually went to Korea. Um, but yeah, essentially trying to solve problems and help people there. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of political uh, stuff around that, but uh, at the end of the day, like what I was there to do is to help um, uh, basically looking at intelligence around how bombs were being made uh, that would, you know, attack the coalition forces. Uh, and then looking at the supply chains as well as uh, the cybersecurity implications of, of those bombs and how they were being uh, detonated. Uh, so, like IEDs and stuff yes. like that? I was, I was working for a task force called uh, Counter IED Operations Integration Center. Right, so yeah. typically under, help us understand what it is. Because you're dealing with very messy data sets, aren't you? Like, yeah. you're not so, it's not so clean, you're dealing with like, lots of human beings, lots of unknowns. What's it like working in that environment? Yeah, I think like, um, you know, you have to get out in the field, right? I think like in any uh, problem solving situation, you need to get to as close to the problem as possible. And my way of getting to uh, close to the problem is, is going there, uh, which is what I did. Going there uh, means what? Into the field where they're planning bombs and stuff? Uh, usually after uh, it happened. I mean, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Still not. I mean, there's a lot of booby traps and stuff. And 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, this stuff happens. I would say, like, it's not as common as, like, would be portrayed on the news. Like, it happens every day, but it happens every day in a country of, like, you know, 30 million people, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's not like it's happening every day. So you, you. you were out there with a flag jacket with a military escort and so on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you were there, like, collecting data, what was going through your mind is, like, did I sign up for this? Is that what you were here to do? Because it must have been, like, surreal... At some point, you're just standing in there in the middle of a field of Afghanistan. Did that sort of click? Did you have those moments? For sure. I think, like, I, I was there almost a year, so I had plenty of time to, to think. And I mean, there's literally nothing to do outside of work and go to the gym. So that's basically all I did and think. Um, so, yeah, plenty of time to think about that. And it, it was, you know, very humbling because uh, you realize, like, you know, all the benefits that you have of living in a first world country. And, uh, have the you know, the, the biggest problem you have to worry about is, like, how do I get to work today and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so. first world problems. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and what did that teach you about a now becoming an entrepreneur and be in cybersecurity working in those kind of environments because I imagine a lot of people have come into that area or into any sort of tech area from a very academic background but you are right in there frontier market full on exposed to all the kind of ups and downs of working in that kind of market how did that sort of shape you and, interview and sort of influence you? Yeah, I guess it, it made me pretty comfortable in getting into situations where, like, the risk was high. Um, it made me understand, like, what risk actually is. And I think, like, you know, there, there's a entrepreneurial risk that all of us take and we build a business. And then there's, like, life and death, death risk. And did you ever have life-threatening moments? Uh, uh, yes, but not, like, not like uh, there was times where I was scared, but not times where I, like, actually thought I was going to die. Let's, let's say that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Can you share any of those with us? Just yeah, so I mean, like, um, you, you basically live in a small city, so uh, it, it would be smaller than Singapore. It'd be like this, as big as the CBD area, which would be like a base, right? And that's that's the kind of living situation you're in. Uh, but then there's walls and everything. Um, but people do shoot rockets inside of the base. Um, but the rocket like has a blast radius radius of like 100 feet. So you can imagine like. Uh, they'll shoot it at the base. It's going to hit something, but usually it's not you, right? Um, and usually it's not even a person, right? It'll hit something. Um, so, like, that would happen a lot. Like, they would shoot rockets. Very rarely did it actually hit any person, um, but it often made loud noises that were, were scary or threatening. And sometimes those loud noises are closer to you than other times. Uh, so you hear the alarm because it basically can tell when the rocket's coming, and then you just kind of, like, sit and wait, or you, like, run to a place where you can get cover. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, that's scary, but it's, it's also, like, existential risk. It's like, it hits me or it doesn't. It's not... Uh, you can't control that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How does that sort of prepare you for being... I know there's not a direct parallel with a startup founder. Yeah. I mean, are there... You wake up in the morning, you're building a business, you've got to start from zero sometimes, go and hustle. Yeah. I know you, you, you're a very high-profile high company. We'll talk a little bit about Harangi in a minute. But mentally, does that shape you in any way for the entrepreneurship journey? Yeah, I think I think most entrepreneurs will tell you it's it's mostly about the people around you, uh, and I think like I'm no different than that. I think like it makes me appreciate like what risk actually is, uh, and like again separating like entrepreneurial risk from life and death risk, and like entrepreneurs often don't face uh, life and death risk, and some people may treat it that way. Uh, it's not, um, and I think like th there's a clear distinction there that you know some people should make. Um, this is a really interesting subject, the difference between entrepreneurial risk and real risk, like real life and death risk. Because yeah. I think a lot of people are scared of starting businesses, mm -hmm. especially here in Singapore where you know the education system has been very successful at training people in a certain way. Yeah. It's a very successful economy. Yet if I start a business, it might all go wrong. Yes. I could work for a bank all it, my life. It probably will go wrong. It, probably, it will go wrong <laughs> every day, right? Yeah. Yet... What I'm getting for you is like, it can go wrong, but you're not going to die. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. It's not fatal. Yeah. I mean, it depends on your business, but okay. pretty much, yeah. <laughs> All right. Within reason, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think that's that's something that, like, it, as long as you can get over failure and, like, make failure part of your learning process, then I, I think, like, you're moving in a positive direction, whether it's your first or, you know, 30th venture that succeeds, like, you will eventually succeed. Yeah. So, Harangi, where does that come in your career path? Was that your first attempt to a startup? Yeah, uh, no. So I, I've been starting businesses since uh, I was in college, uh, uh, small businesses that are uh, different varieties of scale. Um, the first one was like an online magazine that I did while I was in college, uh, talking about like nightlife. How old are you? Uh, 19, I guess. 19. Yeah. 
Um, but you know, it was moderately successful, but no like no funding or anything like that. It was just self-funded and got to a certain scale, and then I joined Palantir and didn't have time anymore. <laughs> yeah, but that taught you a lot, I bet. Sorry, yeah, that taught you a lot about entrepreneurship. Yeah, it, it taught me like how important it is to like have a revenue model. Um, you know, like that that actually matters a lot. Um, and then also uh, taught me like you know how to make connections with people, how to drive a value, how to make people understand the value that they're offering. Um, things like that, and then Palantir only allowed me to like enhance that skill um, because I got a chance at a very early age to talk to like very high level individuals at large companies, mm. uh, solving like very important problems for them. Uh, that, like Palantir roughly costs anywhere between one to five million dollars a month. Uh, so the people that are making that purchasing decision, um, you know, are very powerful people, executives, right? So you explain problems differently to them, and they're one uh, uh, part of an organization that really does understand risk, right? So let's talk about cybersecurity. I'm no expert in cybersecurity. This is your domain, right? So help us understand, what's the problem that you're solving first? Sure. Uh, I think like you can break cybersecurity down into three uh, basic facets. So there's like people, process, uh, and technology. I think a lot of organizations focus on the technology side of things, um, which is important, don't get me wrong, but actually most of the problems happen in that, happen in that people and process side of things. Um, so I think there's a Gardner statistic that talks about 95% of the uh, leaks in the public cloud infrastructure will be from uh, cloud configuration issues, which is actually a human problem. Um, you know, there's technology that can help mitigate that risk, and that's actually what Harangi does. Um, but, you know, in, in the end of the day, like, it, it ends up being a people and process tech uh, uh, problem, and technology is only augmenting and sort of uh, alerting or uh, helping block the people and process issue. Mm. Uh, that's the difficult part, isn't it? The human being in the whole process they're the bit that tends to go wrong, not the technology, right? So when you talk about what you do at Harangi, fundamentally it's a human problem that you're addressing, right? Yeah. The, so how, how do you sort of package that all together with the whole cybersecurity thing? Because somebody, somebody said to me earlier, I, I, in preparing for this, this conversation, I asked a friend who is a, an investor in this space, and he said, look, it's, it's a bit like this. Cybersecurity, it's like, it looks, it's very hard on the outside, but inside it's very sort of soft and mushy in a way. And it's, you, you can, you know, the best way to describe it is that cybersecurity is like a burrito. Yeah. And it's very sort of philosophical, but I took that way and thought about it. It's like, actually, it's really about human beings, right? So how do you help people understand that? You know, how does that actually happen, like, in a day to day basis with cybersecurity? Walk us through an example of where human beings are just the problem. Yeah, I mean, there, there's plenty of uh, issues that have happened recently with like S3 buckets. So uh, if you've used Amazon, great technology, Harangi utilizes it um, every day. Our platform's built on it. Um, but like, if you make the wrong configuration change or you set your password to password, like that's not Amazon's fault, uh, right? Um, so like, that has a lot to do with the people involved and how they're thinking about uh, security. And like, uh, you know, when, when you're on the internet, frankly, like you're pretty much available to anyone in the world to look at. Um, so you know, you have to think about those problems, right? And like, a lot of people, uh, you know, SMBs specifically say that, oh, we, we'll never be a target. But right. like, when you're sitting in a pool of available users and you're the one that left your door unlocked, like, of course you're going to be a target. Right. So do people actually set their password as password? Is that still real? Oh, for sure. Or they'll set it as default, whatever that may be. Uh, yeah. But everyone knows what the default password is because most uh, companies will just post their default password. Yeah. So I was thinking about this earlier is that, I, I don't know about for you guys, you walked in with one of these armbands, right? And the first thing she said to me when she put the armband, this little wristband thing on was, look, keep it loose because if you put it tight, like you'll never be able to get it off and it will like strangle your wrists. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll pay attention to that. And like five minutes later, somehow I pulled it tight and it's like strangling my wrist. Like yeah. you can't account for human stupidity, right? Yeah. It happens. It's around us. So how do you build these billion dollar systems when humans just go and screw it up? Yeah, I mean, you have to assume that it will happen, right? Like, I think, like, <clears throat> in any organization that we talk to, it's all about, like, the first and cheapest and easiest thing for the organization to do is just, like, have a plan, right? So if uh, well, stuff goes wrong, um, basically, you need to know what to do, right? Like, you need to know, like, who you're going to talk to, who you're going to report it to, those types of things, and that's free, right? Uh, and most organizations don't even have that, right? And then there's, like, training. So how do you train your employees to think about security first? Like, uh, I'm lucky enough to come from organizations that were always security first. 
Um, so it's like ingrained in my brain in every decision I make, but uh, not everyone uh, feels that way. And I think like that's that's one thing that organizations can do that's essentially free is like just make security one of the first things that comes to your mind as an organization when you try to solve a problem, uh, and then just like you know assume that the worst will happen and have a plan for that. Does an organization of our size, like Asia Tech Podcast, with five people, need to think about security? Is that an issue? I think it should be a discussion. I mean, I'm sure you have valuable uh, data in some way. Uh, I'm sure if I got your podcast prior to them being released, like that wouldn't help. Um, but yeah, I mean, like again, you wouldn't have to invest money into it, but it's, it's definitely worth a conversation. Yeah, what should that be? Because I'm sure there's a lot of SMEs out there as well thinking like, is cybersecurity relevant to me? Because it sounds like if I'm a bank yeah. or I'm a hospital sitting on top of a whole data set about our customers, that's relevant. Yeah. Like, do you have a lock on your door? Like, why? Singapore. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, I mean, I think it's as simple as that. It's like, right. like, you know, investing in a lock, right? Like, just put antivirus on your computer in your case. Like, it's probably enough in terms of, like, investment versus risk. But um, just thinking about it from your organization, organizational perspective of, like, if someone wanted to hurt us, what would they do? Uh, and knowing and protecting whatever that uh, uh, case may be is important. And then, like, yeah. if they did, like, what what, what do we do? Um, and then, like, I'm an optist. I'm, I'm thinking that people don't want to hurt us because <laughs> we're just a small company. Yeah. But are those people out there? Are they those like? Do they prey on the fact that there are small S SMEs who aren't prepared? Well, let's just say like you're a hacker and you want to make money. Uh, I could attack a bank and steal like cash, right? But banks that invest billions of dollars in cybersecurity. Also, they're definitely going to come after me um, if I were to steal something. Uh, and then you have SMEs, probably don't invest even millions, maybe like hundreds of thousands or less, uh, nothing often cases in cybersecurity. And they probably won't come after me, right? right. I steal $5,000 from 100,000 SMEs, it's the same as stealing $5 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, out of my head. That's right. right. <laughs> and how would that, just gives an idea, how would that actually happen? Because, you know, you understand, like, it's happening to a bank. Yeah. When, like, how would that happen with an SME? Yeah, where, where would we be vulnerable? Yeah, ransomware is like the easiest case. Okay. The people can make a lot of money off of uh, one campaign where they just send it to as many people as they think will click on it. Uh, they click on it and then they you know, collect the ransom. It's all pretty much automated. I think uh, you know the one thing about hackers and like the same similar problems I was facing in Afghanistan is like you know the U.S. military has lots of great technology that does fancy stuff, um, but still uh, you know like a small force of um, uh, sort of very motivated people uh, is able to cause a lot of harm, right? Right. Um, without technology or very minimal technology in terms of what they do. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like hackers can do the same, right? It doesn't always have to be the. There's like an XKCD comic where the guy's like, oh, he invested $10 million in our firewall. And then, like, he goes home and there's a guy with a hammer standing over him, like, what's your password, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. the reality. Yeah. Uh, well, you must understand where these people come from quite well because you've worked in many different fields that you probably had experience with these people directly. Where do they come from? Because I, I suppose the sort of the media narrative is. A kids in their bedroom hacking into the Pentagon. That's one. Yeah. North Korea is another one. Sure. What, what's the reality when it comes to people who are hacking or launching cyber attacks? Is there a difference in the media narrative? Yeah, I think like I mean, the media mostly talks about like the organized groups, groups, and that's like organized crime. Like again, like why would you deal in drugs? Like when it's super risky, you have lots of points of getting caught, and you can do everything from you know Russia or whatever country uh, you, you want to set up in that doesn't have extradition rights to the US. Uh, you know, set up a hacking campaign of ransomware and get the same amount of money probably quicker. Um, you know, so like it makes sense for them. And uh, that's on the organized crime side. You have like the kids uh, who like do it for some sort of um, you know belief that they they believe that this is you know what they want to do and why they want to do it. There's like just the thrill. I think that's also another uh, common thing. They just want to see what they can do, uh, which uh, all of us have done as kids. It's just uh, maybe not uh, as nefarious. Uh, and then you, you have like advanced uh, advanced persistent threats, which are like governments, um, and those like pretty hard to mitigate against um, uh, for any organization, much less a, a government. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would have thought in this day and age, though, that the the, the technology in place to prevent that, especially with banks. I mean, out of interest, and I'm not saying you ever would, but if you ever went rogue, could you break into these, like a bank, for example, and 
Yeah, I think like uh, with enough time and money, anyone can break into anything. Uh, yeah, right. Like I mean, like the analogy I was giving about Afghanistan is like again, U.S. military. Everyone knows they spend a ton of money on building the the best uh, or so-called best uh, international fighting force, right? Uh, but then you have like the Taliban, right? Like you know, a bunch of guys don't have that much access to resources or technology, still can cause a lot of pain, right? Right. Um, so like human ingenuity is an amazing thing, right? That's what makes us entrepreneurs, but it also makes like sort of nefarious people nefarious, right? They'll figure out a way. Uh, the important thing is time uh, there and money, right? Like how much money are they willing to invest uh, and time are they willing to invest to get in? If it's like, if you can make it not worth it for them to make that time or investment, then, you know, you're usually pretty much okay. Again, when you get involved with advanced persistent threats like governments, I think it's a different story and like you're always at risk. It's more about mitigating at that point. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, that's what it is. So, Paul, do you, do you ever get to know the people on the other side, like rather than just being sort of faceless, anonymous hackers or groups, do you ever have communication with them? You you get to understand their personalities and like where they come from. Does that is that sort of more the domain of Hollywood, or is that the reality? No, I, I think it definitely happens, right? Like, I mean, um, not myself, but I, I know people in the space that have you know arrested uh, hackers. Um, you know, like, and definitely a lot of that has to do with like figuring out where they are or who they are or what group they're a part of and infiltrating it. Uh, I've never done that, um, but I, I do know people that have done that, and it does happen. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely if you if you're an nefarious actor, like in any way, like whether it's like on hacking or a uh, criminal organization, like like the police will come after you eventually uh, yeah. in some way, and like. You know, like uh, I think you know, police also have a lot of investment in terms of uh, technology in the hacking space. There's like like plenty of international organizations uh, as well uh, that can do things like that. Yeah. Cool. And uh, maybe just sort of share. Uh, I'm curious to know what the the high profile cases have been recently of very sort of premeditated hacks or data leaks in a sense, and how they've affected organizations. So maybe you can share with us something that's happened recently in your world, yeah. which is very indicative of a trend in cyber attacks or hacking. Yeah, I think there's a lot to do with uh, third party risk. Uh, so that's, like if you do business with a third party, um, you know, like they, their your data is essentially going to them and then they could also be at risk. So it happened to Facebook, I think just in April, uh, essentially like one, two of their third parties were storing a lot of Facebook's data uh, and left an open S3 bucket, in this case, uh, available to the internet, and like 540 million records were stolen. Facebook got blamed, it wasn't actually their fault, um, but but again, kind of is their fault because they didn't, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm not actually sure, but uh, there wasn't, the third party itself is the one that lost the data, not Facebook. Um, well, why should we be concerned about that? Because sometimes I feel, and maybe I'm just getting used to it, is that if I see somebody's hacked and stolen, for example, email information, yeah. I often feel, nah, it's not too bad. It's only my email address. What are they going to do with it? Yeah. Uh, should I be worried? I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I would say, like, in general, like, I mean, in the, in the internet and the, in the space, like, you should always be thinking about it. I, I, I think worried is, like, a different thing, I think. Um, but at least thinking about it so that, like, oh, if your email's late, like, you're probably going to get some more phishing emails. Uh, you'll get people trying to... Uh, send you stuff that uh, you normally wouldn't get. So it's just like, you know, adding an additional level of filter, like when you open that email or when you're clicking on attachments, uh, especially. Um, so I would think about it like that. I mean, I don't think it adds any existential risk. Like if you if you have stored your password there, then definitely you should change your password. Um, even if your email is leaked, it's just easier uh, to do that um, and safer. Do we use a different password for different services, for example? Or? You, you should. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's very difficult to do that because I'm sure we now register for over three or four hundred things each each and every one of us. Yeah. Um, but definitely, like, if you can, you should. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, I use Evernote. Yeah. And I use Dropbox, and I store sensitive information there. I store passwords there. Uh, so, on the the assumption that it's safe, is that sort of I'm putting myself at risk because I'm sure people do. I put bank details on there. Like I use Evernote to store bank statements. I use Dropbox to store all my personal bank statements and everything. Am, am I sort of putting myself out there at risk? Or yeah, I mean, like in general, I think both of them are safe, ser pretty safe services. Like, but um, I, I wouldn't put additional risk, right? Because you're basically putting all your information in one uh, place, uh, which. Now that everyone knows, uh, you know, would be the first place I would go, right? Um, I, I think, 
Yeah, I mean, Dropbox had a leak in 2012, like where they actually like their passwords got compromised. Um, so I hope you ch change your password after that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think like, phones, by the way. it's probably not a good idea. Right. Uh, and like I would use like a password manager. I think is a better case, just because um, you know generally like they spend a lot more time on building that uh, securely. Yeah. It wouldn't be like all the eggs in one basket in most cases because it's encrypted inside of the password manager. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I think this is the problem, isn't it, with cybersecurity? Is that even people like myself in the tech space, I should know better. You know, but we're just sort of creatures of habit, sometimes yeah. a bit lazy. Yes. And that's the vulnerability, right? Yeah, for sure. It is. Uh, I mean, it's like you just don't know. And so ignorance, like uh, laziness, uh, or just habit. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they're feeding on, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, just like any criminal, right? They, they feed on that, right? They exactly. Not necessarily the fact there's a vulnerability in the tech stack or the, the firewall, right? No. It's the vulnerability in the... The inside the burrito, right? So yeah, I think most hacks is basically because of something that could have easily been fixed. The majority of them are, are that, right? Yeah. It's cool. So I think we're running out of time, but um, I don't know if there was any questions flashed up here about cybersecurity or questions to Paul. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if they're going to put the Slido back. Yeah, maybe not. But. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, if you have a question, throw up your hands. Otherwise, um, but I want to ask you a question. It's just, I mean, I don't know if they're going to throw that up there. So it's the live tech demo. So who knows what could happen? So, what, what do you see? I mean, for yourself in the future, where does it go from here? I mean, you guys are growing really fast. I see you everywhere, and you're speaking everywhere. Like, you know, this. I know you know you started a, a startup when you were startup. You started a business when you were 19, but now you're starting a, a high growth business. You've got a lot of good backing as well. How does the future look for you? You know, you're based here in Singapore. When you look sort of a year, two years out, what do you see? Yeah, I think like uh, we're doing regional expansion. So uh, we do have six offices uh, already. Uh, I think we'll continue to grow within those six offices, but also probably invest in a couple of new markets. Uh, we're starting our fundraise now for our next round. So we'll raise our Series B. Um, look How much are you raising? Uh, 20 to 25 million. Oh. Uh, yeah. And then we'll continue to build our product. I think it's an important part of our business and always will be uh, as the product that we're building. Um, but we also do services, right? And I think that's um, quite different from a lot of the, the businesses in the, the rest of uh, uh, Echelon. But uh, we feel like it's an important part of building trust with our customers is by doing the services. Um, a lot of the bigger customers just know how to buy it. It's easier for them. And the smaller customers need it, uh, but need it at an affordable price. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can offer one piece of advice as well, because there may be people in this space. It, it, this is the biggest problem in cybersecurity is investment. Yeah. And a lot of the early stage startups are struggling to find investment because you have to be a cybersecurity investor, right? So what advice would you give them, just sort of rounding up, because we've got a minute left. If I'm in that space, I'm a startup, I might be an accelerator, like a Cylon, for example. Yeah. How do I get out of there? Because I might not have worked for the the uh, for Palantir, or I might not have worked for the Defense Forces. So what do I do? Yeah, I think like traction is really important. So having customers, like paying or not, I think like paying is obviously better. Uh, but just having customers using our product and saying positive things about it really helps. Uh, and then making sure those customers talk to whatever VC uh, you were trying to work with, uh, like that, that's super powerful. Uh, I think like you know now there's a bit more people in cybersecurity in the space, so they have time. Uh, to do due diligence, like um, for, for us, like Chris Hall, uh, who's an advisor to Monks Hill, uh, did some due diligence on us, who, who has some cyber experience. Uh, I help out some of the funds as well in doing that due diligence. But um, yeah, I think like, you know, the problem that we talked about earlier was basically that there's just not that many successful cybersecurity companies in the region. And then like for those companies to exit, then there will then be a new growth of uh, be you. space. Hopefully me, if not someone else, but yeah. uh, at least someone. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I hope so. Look forward to it. Oh, thanks. And I hope to see more of you as well, Paul. Thanks for sharing your journey with us today. Thank you so much, everybody, as well, for sitting in. Let's give Paul a round of applause. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, um, this might be a little um, serious topic. So we, we have come to 